We recently did a video on Django Cotton, which is an amazing new component framework for Django. In this video, we're going to show a new example that uses HTMX, and what we're going to do is show the simplified setup of Django Cotton. It's much simpler than even before to set this up and start using components in Django. And what we're going to do is create a pretend car rental company, and we're going to create this functionality that you see here. So we have different components that we're going to create. For example, this filter component on the left-hand side, a car list component on the right that contains a car card component for each car in the page. And we also have a pagination component at the bottom that allows us to toggle between different pages. And that's all going to use HTMX in order to perform the filtering, the pagination, and so on. So we're going to build all of that. And we also have a clear filters button that we're going to implement as well. And this is all built with HTMX and Django with four Django Cotton components. And these are reusable components that we could take from one application and move into another application very easily. So we're going to get started building this. But if you're enjoying this content, make sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. And if you want to support the channel, then we have a coffee page linked in the description. And I want to thank everyone who's donated to this page. It's greatly appreciated and it really helps to keep going with the channel. Thanks again and let's get started. So let's start with the installation here. So I've got a GitHub repository for this project that contains some starter code in this directory. And we also have the final code from the end of the video in the second directory here if you want to check that out. Now you can use the git clone command to clone this repository. And I've already done that just now. And if we open up VS Code, you can see we have the project here and we have the starter code open. Now requirements.txt contains the external requirements for this project and you can install them with the pip install-r requirements.txt command and you should do that in a Python virtual environment and you can see I've got one open here. Now I've not added Django Cotton to requirements so we're going to quickly install that in a second but it's a quickly evolving package so I didn't want to add it here we're going to install that and get the latest version in this virtual environment. Now I want to continue the setup here. So once you've cloned the project and installed requirements, what you can do is run python manage.py and it's the migrate command to create your local database. So we're going to run that just now and that's applying all of those migrations and it's going to create a db.sqlite file. Once your database is created, I'm going to clear the terminal and we're going to have a quick look at what we have in the starter code. Very quick look here at the models.py file. So we have a car model and that makes sense. We have a car rental application that we're going to build here. So we've got a car model that contains some fields. I'm not going to go over all of these, but for example, we have transmission that is automatic or manual as a choice field and so on. And as well as the model, we have a custom management command called create data.py. And what this is going to do in the starter code is it's going to populate the database with 25 sample cars. So we've got a for loop here and we're creating a car and we're making use of the random module in Python to create some cars in the database with some somewhat random data. So I'm going to run this command and the way you run a custom management command in Django is to run manage.py and then the name of the file, which is create data. Once you run that, you're going to create 25 cars in the database and we're now ready to get started. So we're going to start by installing Django Cotton. Very simple command here, but before you do that, make sure you've got the latest version of pip and you can run pip install dash dash upgrade or dash capital U pip in order to do that. Now I've got the latest version, but what we can do after we've done that is we can run pip install Django Cotton. That's going to install it into this virtual environment. And you can use the pip freeze command in order to check which versions have been installed. And you can see it's 0.9.32. That's the version of Django Cotton. I'm going to open the Django Cotton GitHub repository. So let's go over there just now. And you can see the version here matches the one that we have locally. So we've got this installed. Now in the first video about Django Cotton, we went through the installation steps and I'll leave a link to that video just above on the screen at the moment. But since that video was released, Django Cotton has simplified the installation even more. So if we go to the quick start on the documentation, and this is linked in the description, after we install Django Cotton, we actually only need to add Django Cotton to installed apps in order for this to work now. Previously, we had to amend the template setting. We don't need to do that now. But if we add Django Cotton to installed apps, it's automatically going to handle the settings.py for example, adding the required loader and template tags. So let's go back to the project and I'm going to minimize the terminal now that we've got that installed. And let's go to settings.py and at the bottom, let's add Django Cotton here. 
So we've got that installed just now and let's just make sure that everything is running successfully. I'm going to run the Django development server and we're going to go to localhost 8000. And when we go to that, you can see the page here, welcome to Scott Wheels, that's all it says. We have no other content, so we're going to build this up iteratively throughout the video using Django Cotton and HTMX. So now that we've got this working, let's go to the rentalcars.com webpage. And this layout, we're going to try very loosely to replicate this. So we have on the left hand side a section of filters. We're going to add a couple of these and we're going to use HTMX to allow us to filter the list on the right hand side. And then we have on the right hand side a list of different rental cars. And each car within the list is in a card of its own. So we're going to have some different components here. One for the list itself, one for the card for each car that we have in the system. And we're also going to add a filter component using Django Cotton on the left hand side. And finally, one more component we're going to add is the pagination component. So basically we want to load a subset of the cars on each request. And then we're going to have some pagination links at the bottom. That's going to use HTMX in order to fetch the next set of cars. So four components I want to build in Django Cotton in total. So let's get started with that. And we're going to try and replicate this layout using Tailwind CSS and Daisy UI. So let's start with the car list component. And that's going to be one here that tells us the number of cars that we have in the response or in the database, sorry. And as well as that, a list of all of the cars just below here. So let's go back to VS Code and we're going to minimize this terminal. And what I want to do within the core application, and that's the main application in the project, is go to the templates directory and I'm going to create a cotton subdirectory here. So we've got a cotton directory and within there we can create the components that we're going to actually use in this application. So I want to create a car list.html component and we're going to have that here within the cotton directory. Now as well as the list, I want to also add a component here for each card for the individual car in that list. So we're going to add that as well. And we're going to add some dummy HTML content to these. So let's start with the list. I'm just going to add an H2 here. So it's going to say this is a car list. And if we go to the card component, we can paste in this is a card here. And we're now going to load these in index.html just to make sure that our setup is going to work. So let's go down underneath the header one tag. And what I'm going to do here is use the c-car-list and that references that car list component. And if you want to know more about that, check out the first video on Django Cotton. So we're referencing the component here and I'm now going to save this and let's go back to our page here. And if we refresh that, you can see we get the header from the car list component. So this syntax here to actually render that component here in the DOM, that is now working. Now in the car list component, we are going to have a for loop and we're going to iterate over cars that we've got in the context for this template. So we need to amend views.py. I'm going to go to views.py and it's this index view here. We want to fetch the cars that we've loaded into the database and return them in this view here. So remember from models.py, we have this car model. And what I'm going to do is set up a variable here called car. And it's going to be equal to this ORM statement here, car.objects.filter. And if you look at models.py, we're going to look at the car model. And we have a field here, and it's a Boolean field called is available. That was part of this data. So we're going to filter based on that. And we only want to return the cars where is available is equal to true. So imagine we want to rent a car and we're going to view the list page. We don't want cars that are unavailable to show up here. And then we're going to add these cars to the context. And actually I want to add a second variable and that's the count of these cars, the number of cars basically that are available and that we're getting back. So let's add a car count variable and that's going to be equal to the cars query set dot count. So we call the dot count function to get the number back here. And you could also use the len function in Python in order to get that. So we now have cars available in the context as well as the car count. Let's go back to the car list and I'm going to change what's displayed here. So let's get rid of this header to tag and we're going to add a div here and I'm going to give this div an ID actually of car dash list. We're going to target that with HTMX later in the video and let's close that off. So what I'm going to do to start with is add a header one tag here and we're giving it some classes from Tailwind. We don't have Tailwind in the project yet, but we're going to add it soon. And we're rendering out the number of cars that are available based on that query set and based on the car count that we're adding to the context. And once we've got that, we can create a template for loop with the for template tag. So for each car, and we're going to use the cars that we've got in the context. Let's end that for loop here. What we're going to do within here is we're going to render that car card component. So c-car-card. And I'm going to close that off just now. So let's go back to the page here and refresh this page. And we're getting an error that the manager object has no attribute filters. I believe if we go back to views.py, I probably made a mistake here. So let's get rid of that. We're using the dot filter function. Let's try this again. 
and this time we have a different page showing up. So we've got 15 cars available and then for each one of them we're rendering out the content of this card component. So the card component needs to be different so I'm going to remove that header 2 tag. And let's just reference one of the fields on the car and that's the make of the car for now. And what we're going to do is go back here and you can see we get a different response. We have the different makes, the different manufacturers of the cars. So we're getting that here. And we're going to build this up incrementally, the card component, so that it looks like the card that you see here fairly loosely. This is not going to be perfect. We don't have time for that, but we're going to get started with that soon. But in order to make it look better, we're going to need Tailwind CSS to be installed in this project. So let's move on to that. Now I'm going to use Daisy UI and we're going to go to the documentation here. This is the most popular component library for Tailwind. And in order to install that, we can go to the sidebar and go to this installation section. And for simplicity, let's just use the CDN in this video. And we're going to copy these links here into our project. So our project has a base.html file. And we're going to paste the two links into that file. Now that means that because our index.html and all of the components are extending this base template, they're all going to have access to Daisy UI and Tailwind CSS classes. Now one other thing to note just before we go on is that we have a static directory and I've grabbed a random car image from the web and we've got that available. We're going to use that as the car image. So if we go back to the page here, you can see that each car has its own image. Of course, I don't want to make this too complicated, so we're just going to render statically that same image for each car. In a normal application, what you would do is you would go to models.py and your car model would have some kind of image field, potentially multiple image fields, and that would have the actual image for the car. But we're not going to do that in this video. Now I'm going to paste some code into this card component. So let's get rid of car.make at the top here. And there's quite a lot of code here, so I'm going to paste it in and we're going to go to the top and go over this. But if you want to use this code, you can actually get it from the GitHub repository. So if we go back to the GitHub repository, you can go to the final code page and you can find some of this code within the templates directory of the core application. And it's the car card component that we have here. So you can copy the code from this and I think that's going to work if you just paste that into the component. So that's where you can get the code. Let's go back to VS Code just now and make sure we save this file and we can then go and have a look at this and see how it's changed. So when we refresh the page, you can see the whole UI has changed. Our card component now looks a lot better and it very loosely follows the styles here. Obviously we don't have the sidebar at the moment, but we've got the image on the left hand side and we have some information about the car in the middle and we have this call to action at the right hand side and that's replicated here. We could probably improve this somewhat and this code is on GitHub. So if you want to open a pull request or suggest improvements in the comments, feel free to do so. That would be amazing if you want to do that. But here we have a super simple version of this layout. And this should also be responsive. So if we collapse this to a smaller screen, you can see that it still looks pretty good at the smaller screen size. And instead of left to right, this is stacking up top to bottom. So let's go to VS Code and have a look at some of these styles. We're not going to spend too long on this. But basically in order to create that, we've got the CSS grid classes from Tailwind CSS. And the grid container is taking up four columns here, as you can see. But the children are going to take up a variable number of those columns based on the screen size. So for example, the image that we've got here, that is by default going to span the four columns, as you can see on the mobile view here. But as we make that bigger, you can see it splits into a different layout where it's going to take up two columns out of four on small to medium screens and you can see that here two out of four of the column spaces and then finally on the medium screen and above it's going to take up one column of the space so if we go back to the largest screen that's one quarter of the card and then the other child in the card is this one here that contains all of the content to the right of the image and if we go back to the html here again on the smallest screens it's going to take up the full four columns but that's going to adjust based on the screen size so you can inspect this, it's just using CSS grid and then each of the children in that is also using grids with particular column spans. So that is going to create this view here. And there might be different ways to do that. There might be better ways to actually get that. So if you have any ideas for that also, let us know in the comments. But let's now move on. Now we want on the left hand side to have a filters section just like this here. So what we're going to do next is add a filters component and we're going to create a layout here for the filters to be on the left hand side and the cards and the list component to be on the right. Now if we look at this here, I'm going to create another CSS grid and the filters are going to take up a quarter of that grid and the car list component on the right is going to take up three quarters of that space. 
And what we're going to do on mobile screens is basically remove the filters and we're going to have a button at the top that's going to allow them to be displayed above the cards on mobile screens. So we need to get started building that. So let's go back to the index.html file. At the moment we're just rendering out the car list but we want to create another surrounding div here and that div is going to use the CSS grid classes here and I'm actually going to write this it's not going to be a lot of CSS but we want to create another four column grid system and we're going to place some of the child elements within that grid. Now the car list here I'm going to create a surrounding container and that's going to be a section and we're going to give it a class of call span 4. So by default on mobile screens it's going to have four columns and that's going to match the full column span of the grid. And then when we hit the larger screens we're going to move to call span 3 and we're going to leave one of the four columns for the filters that we're going to add in a second. So let's close that section off and then what I'm going to do is copy this and I'm going to paste it just above here and we're going to change the section at the top. So by default this is going to be hidden. So let's remove call span 4 and we're going to add the hidden class from Tailwind and that's because on mobile screens we don't want the filters to be showing and we're going to change the component here to the car filters component and in fact let's just call this filters c-filters and finally we need to change these here. So what I'm going to do on large screens is change from display none, which is the hidden class, to display grid. And that's going to use the grid class from Tailwind CSS. And then on large screens we need to give this a column span as well. So it's going to be call span 1. And the reason for that is because we want the car list to take up 3 out of 4 columns. And when we have the filter showing on large screens we want them to take up 1 out of 4 columns. And finally I want to also add an ID to the section surrounding the filters. So we're going to give it an ID of filters. Now what I need to do is create this component here in Django Cotton. So let's go to the Cotton directory and we're going to create filters.html. Remember that has to match what we've got in the markup. So we've got c-filters, so we create a filters.html component. And for now let's just add some text. This is a filter and that's going to show on the screen. And we can test this out if we go back to our page here. Let's refresh the page and we can see now we have a different layout. At the left hand side we've got the filters section. At the right hand side we've got the car list. And if we go to smaller screens you can see the filters are removed because that hidden class is added and that removes the filters and later on we're going to have a button to allow us to display them above the cards at the top here. So let's get back to creating this and it's time to introduce pagination and htmx into this project. So what I'm going to do is open the pagination documentation from Django and I've got a link to that below the video. We're going to use the pagination utilities from the framework in order to create a list that's not got all of the cars on the page by default, but we're going to paginate five at a time. So let's go back to this documentation and we're going to scroll down here until we get to the section on paginating a view function. And we're going to replicate this code here where we create a query set and then we pass that query set to the paginator object and we give it a number to paginate by. We can then extract the page that we're on from the get request. And in order to get the correct page of results, we call the get page method on the paginator object and we pass that page number in to get that page of results. And finally we can add that page object to the context. So let's go back to VS Code and we're going to go to views.py and at the top here we're going to import the paginator object. So let me copy that and I'm going to paste this in right at the top of the file. So from django.core.paginator we can import that object. And then within the function after we fetch the cars from the database that query set we can pass it to the paginator object. So we pass the cars and I'm going to get five cars at a time here. We can then get a page number from the request. So we're going to use request.get and we're going to try and extract a page from the get request from the URL and we can default to page one here. And finally we get that page object by calling the paginator.getPage method. And the getPage method is going to take a page number. So we pass that in there and then we can add the page object here to the context. Now I'm actually going to replace the cars object. So we're going to get rid of the entire query set of cars. And we're going to pass the page of results that we get back into the context. So let's save this and if we go back to the page we're going to see that that breaks everything here. We don't have cars showing anymore so we need to go back to the list component and what we're iterating over with the for template tag we're going to change that to the page object and then if we go back we should see that it's all working again. 
Now because we're paginating with 5 cars at a time, even though there's 15 cars available, we only see 5 of them on the car list component. So what we want to do at the bottom of this component is add pagination links. So for example to go to the next page or the previous page or to the very last page in the results, we can also do that. Now I'm going to grab some code from Django's documentation. So let's go back to that page we were on before and it's this code here. So what I'm going to do is copy the div that we've got here with the class of pagination and all of its child elements. And we're going to go back to VS Code and what I want to do in the cotton directory is create another component and this is going to be the fourth and final component we're going to create and that's going to be pagination.html. We can then paste that code from Django in here and we're going to amend this in a second. So we have a pagination component and in the car list template below the for loop I want to add those links. So what I'm going to do here is reference the cotton component. So it's going to be c-pagination and let's close that off and we're going to see if that works. So let's go back to the page here and we're going to refresh this page and you can see at the bottom here we now have some links and if we click next here we're going to see that we get the next page of results. And that's all working but it's not using htmx at the moment so we're going to see how we can achieve this effect with htmx and without a page reload. Now just before we add htmx to the project I want to style up these pagination links at the bottom. Now I'm going to go to the Daisy UI page on pagination and I'll leave a link to that below the video and we're going to style these links with the default styles from Daisy UI. Now we need to add a class of join to a container element which is a div and then add join item to the actual pagination links. So what we're going to do is go back to our new component pagination.html and I'm going to change the pagination class that we have so we're going to use the join class from Daisy UI and then each of the links that we have here what we're going to do if we go back here is we're going to create a button within the anchor tag and that's going to have the join item and the button classes from Daisy UI. So what I'm going to do is go back to pagination.html and within here I'm going to get rid of the text here and I'm going to add a button within here with the same text but basically we're taking the anchor tag and we're creating a button within it with the join item and the button classes from Daisy UI and then we can keep the text within the button and close off the anchor tag. Here we have an anchor tag that says previous so again let's just follow the same process we add a button with the same text and we add those classes and we're going to do that for the two anchor tags at the bottom here when the page object has a next page. So let's go in here I'm going to remove this text of next and we can add another button here with the same text and the same classes as we've been doing so far and finally for the final page and we can get that from the page object by getting a reference to the parent paginator object and the number of pages within that and let's add our final button in here and we can save this and go back to our application. So at the bottom we've got these links when we refresh the page you can see the styles have changed here and we now have these links that look a bit better, they're coming from Daisy UI. Of course if you want to style these further feel free to do so. So we can navigate to the previous page, to the next page and also to the first and last pages of the data. So we now need to switch all of these to be using HTMX. So what I'm going to do is go to the HTMX documentation and we're going to install HTMX. So I'm going to paste that in here and I'll leave a link to this below the video. We're going to grab this from the CDN. So let's copy the script tag and we're going to go back to base.html within this Django project and that's within the starter code and we can add that below the tailwind script tag. Now after we add that we can go back to pagination.html and basically what we're going to do is look at all of these anchor tags and these have an href that tells the anchor tag where to send the request and that adds the page number to that request. Now in order to switch all of these to use htmx and therefore use an ajax request under the hood what we're going to do is we're going to search for all of the href attributes in this template and we're going to replace them with the hx-get attribute. So let's do that just now and that's going to switch these up to send htmx get requests to our Django server with the given page number. Now when we get a response we want to replace the list of cars that we've got with the next page of cars. So for example if we go back to our application just now here we have a set of cars and I'm going to refresh this and if we go down to the bottom and we go to the previous page in this case we want to replace the list that's here with the previous page of cars. Now you can see that something weirds happened here. When we got the response from the now HTMX request it's taking the original element which was the pagination link and it's replaced that with the entire response content. So we've got this extremely weird looking page now. So let's say we don't want to deploy this to production. We need to fix this because users are going to think what the hell is going on here. So let's fix it up now and go to the top here 
what we're going to do is we're going to set a target for the response. So let's go back to our HTML and we're going to go to the car list page. And here within the car list component, we have a div with the ID of car list. This content here is what we want to replace with the response that we're going to get back. So what we're going to do is go back to pagination.html and we need to add a target to each of these HTMX requests. Now something I've not shown before in the channel is that you can actually set a target on a parent element and that's going to be inherited by all of the children. And that's what we want to do here because all of these links, the pagination links, are going to have the same target and the same swap mechanism. So what we're going to do is just set these attributes on the div with the class of join and we're going to set a target to the ID of car-list. That's going to match what's in the car list component. And then we can set a swap method of outer HTML. Now I'm going to save this and we're going to go back to the page and let's refresh the page. And now when we go back to the bottom here, if we go to the previous page here, you can see we're still getting some weird results. And that's again because we're not returning exactly the correct partial, but at least we're getting something different. We're not getting the content at the bottom replacing the pagination link. So let's now fix this final issue and we can do that by going to views.py. So let's load the views.py and at the bottom here, we're going to add an if statement to check if it's an HTMX request. Now we can do that by installing the Django HTMX package if you want to do that, but we can also just check the request headers. So if we've got this hx-request in the request.headers property, then we can return a different template based on that. And what we can actually return here is the Django Cotton component for the car list. And that's exactly what we want to return. So let's pass the request to the render function. And here we're going to pass the cotton slash car underscore list component. So we're referencing that HTML file that represents the Django Cotton component for the car list. And that's exactly what we want to return in order to replace this list of cars that we get here on the page. And finally, we need to add the context to this. So let's do that as well. So we're actually returning here the Django Cotton component as the HTMX response. And HTMX is going to take the content from this component and it's going to swap it into the target, which in this case is the car list, and it's going to replace the outer HTML. Let's now test this out. I'm going to refresh the page and let's go to the bottom here. And by default, we're stuck on page three here. But if we go back to previous now, you can see that that's updated the list here and it's replaced the cars in that list. And we can go to the very first page here and we're going to get the first page of content. We still get the total number of cars available, but each page has five cars and we can then paginate between each of these pages. Now I've removed page equals three from the top here. But because we're using an HTMX request, an AJAX request, it's not going to update that URL each time it fetches a new page of data. So that's expected as well. One thing I want to add is I want to scroll or show the top of the target component each time we click a pagination link. So for example, if we click next here, you can see we're still at the bottom of the page, but we can actually go to the top of the target. So in order to do that, let's go back to VS Code. And what we can do here in the HX swap attribute is we can add a second modifier here and it's going to be show top. So that simple modifier, if we go back to the page and refresh, is going to scroll back to the top of the page when we click one of these pagination links. So click next and you're taken to the top, not specifically of the page, but actually of the target component. And in this case, that's the car list that has the number of cars available and the list below. So now each time we click one of the buttons, we're going to get the next page of data and that next page is going to be swapped into the DOM and it's going to scroll to the top of the target element. So let's finish this video by adding the filters on the left hand side of the page. If we go back to our original site, there's various different filters here. We're only going to add one on ours, but we're going to use HTMX in order to filter the paginated data on the right hand side. So let's get started with that. And what I want to filter is the transmission type of the car. It can either be automatic or manual. So let's go back to VS Code. And let's now go to filters.html. This is our filter component in Django Cotton. Let's clear what we have here. And I'm going to add a header here, just using some text, XL and font bold classes from Tailwind. And that's going to say filter. Now we're also adding a div container here with a class of border and rounded large. And also some padding here of three. Now let's go back to what we have here on our page and we're going to refresh this. And you can see now we have a border around the filters. And I think it's rounded as well, if you can see that here. So we now have that, but what we want to do is give some spacing between this particular filter here and the content to the right hand side, which is the car list. So we can do that in index.html. So let's go back here, 
that's where we defined the CSS grid. So as well as giving the grid four columns, what we're going to say is we want some gap on the x-axis and I'm going to set that to four. That's again a class from Tailwind CSS. And if we go back here and refresh, you can see we now get some gap between the columns in that grid system. Now we also want a clear all filters link like we've got here. So we're going to add that at the top. Let's go back to our filters component that we have. And what I'm going to do here is create a flex box around this content. So let's give it a class of flex. And we're going to justify the content between each side of that flex container. And let's give it an items center class as well. So we've got our H2 within that flex box and we can close the div off. And we're also going to add our clear all filters link here. So let's create an anchor tag. And for now, an href just of the hash symbol. And I'm going to add some classes here from Tailwind. So let's paste the classes in. And you can see we've got text blue 500. And we're going to darken that on hover. And we're also going to underline the anchor tag on hover. And we're going to make the text quite small and also give it the cursor pointer class. So let's see how that looks just now. You can see we have clear all filters and that darkens and underlines when we hover over the element. Now if we go back to that, it kind of closely matches what we have here, may not be perfect, but it's going to do for now. I also want to add a divider just below the filter header and this anchor tag, so let's do that as well. And we're going to use a divider class from Daisy UI in order to do this. So let's create a div that's just got a class of divider, and we can just close that div off and see how that looks. Now I think I've added this in the wrong place, so let me cut this out of here. This shouldn't be part of the Flexbox, this should be underneath the Flexbox, so let's paste it in here. And we're going to go back to the page and refresh. So we're back on the page and when we refresh you can see that divider appearing here. Now I want to reduce the margin here a little bit, so what I'm going to do is add a margin Y of 2, and that's actually going to reduce some of that margin and bring the divider closer to the content above. And now we can actually build the filter form here in order to allow us to filter by transmission type of manual versus auto. Now on our original site here, each filter has a header, so we're going to go back to filters.html, and underneath the divider, let's add a header of transmission, and we can go back and see how that looks. So this is going to be the transmission filter, and that's an H3 with a class of font bold. And below that, we're going to add a form here, and we're going to give it an ID of filter form, and that's important because HTMX is going to use that later on. And we're going to add the form in a second. Now for this, we're going to have two options, and that's going to be manual and automatic. I'm going to load up some documentation from Daisy UI, and it's this checkbox here with the info color that we're going to use. If we look at the HTML, that's created with a div container with a class of form control, and then the label contains the input element with the type of checkbox. Now I'm just going to copy this code, and we're going to go back to our form here. Let's remove the comment, and we're going to paste two of these divs in. And in fact, let me just get rid of the second for now. We only need one of these because I'm going to copy that after I've changed it a little bit. So the label that we've got here has a class of cursor, pointer, and label. I'm also going to add a justify start to that. And we want the input to appear before the text, as you can see here. So the actual checkbox should appear before the label. Now, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is go back to here, and we're going to move the input above the span. So let's do that just now and reorder that. And we're also going to add a margin right of two to that input. And we don't want the input to be checked by default, so I'm going to remove that. And what we need to do in order to send this to the server is give the element a name so we know what to extract on the server. I'm going to give this a name of transmission. And let's give it a value of M for manual. Now we need to change the label text from this to manual here. And what we're going to do is just copy this entire div and we're going to paste it below here. Now this div is going to be for automatic, so let's change this here, and the value is going to be A. And the reason that we're using these, if we go back to models.py, is because the transmission has some choices attached to it, and a max length of 1. So in the database, this is going to be stored with the value A for automatic, and M for manual. So we want to reference the values within our filters component here, so it's going to be M for manual, and A for automatic in the value attribute. And you could set this up with a Django form class, but I'm just going to skip that for this video. Now, after making those changes, I'm going to save this and let's go back to our page here. And we can see we get two checkboxes that we can tick here. And importantly, we can actually tick both of these. So if we wanted to select both, that's an option that's available to us. And that matches the functionality of the original site. Now, when the user actually selects one of these, we want to send a GET request to do the filtering of the content on the right-hand side. So let's go back to filters.html. 
And to both of these input elements, what we're going to do at the bottom here is add a GET request. So HX GET, and, a, and we're going to send that to the same URL that we've been using in this application, and that's the index URL. So I'm going to copy the HX GET request, and we're going to paste that on the second checkbox just below here. And that's basically going to send the data in the transmission variable of the GET request, as we're about to see. Now we've got the same target for our response because when we filter the data, we want to replace the list on the right hand side in the same manner that we did with the pagination links. So let's go back to our code. And if we go back to the pagination component here, I'm gonna take this content here and copy that into filters.html. And again, because these are inherited, what I'm gonna do is add them to the div at the root of this component. So the target's the car list, and we're gonna replace the outer HTML with what we get back in the response. Now there's one extra attribute that I want to add here and that's the content from the form itself. So we're gonna use HX include here and we're gonna select our own filter form that we've created. So let me explain what we're doing here. We have a form that contains an ID of filter form. And if I separate this into new lines here, the attributes from the root div, we're including all of the fields that have been selected in that filter form in the request using the HX include attribute. Now the reason for that is because if we select one of these, we don't just want to send that in the request. Potentially we would have multiple of these filters selected. So if we select both of them, we want to send both of the selections for transmission data in that request. Now to include all of the selected fields from a form or all of the values from a form, you can just include it using the HX include attribute and set that to the form element containing the values. Now we need to handle this in the view and before we do that, I just want to show the request that's gonna be sent here. So after we've added all that, let's save the filters component and we can refresh this page. And each time we click this, you can see that something's going on and I'm gonna select automatic as well and we can go back to VS Code and let's have a look at the GET requests that are being sent here. So when we selected the first checkbox, it was adding transmission set to the value M for manual. And then when we selected the second one, you can see that it added not only transmission set to M for manual, but also the new one, which was A for automatic. So we have multiple values here for the transmission GET request variable. So we need to get those in the view now and do some filtering. So in order to get that in the view, we can go back to this page here and it's the index function. And we're going to extract the transmission that's potentially in the get request. So we can do that with request.get and then because that returns a query dictionary, we can call .get on that. And we can then try and extract transmission from that request. Now .get is gonna get us back a single value, but we saw in the get request here that we can potentially have multiple values for transmission. So whenever you expect that a form field can send multiple values, you can use the get list function or method on the Django query dict object and extract all of those. Now, after we get these transmission objects, we then get the cars in the database and we're filtering to only the cars that are available. But then after we construct this statement here, we want to do a check to see if we have any transmission data from the get request. And then we're gonna take the cars that we've got and we're gonna call cars.filter and we're gonna check if the transmission data is in what's been sent by the user. So we set it equal to the value on line seven. So I'm just gonna explain this a little bit before we move on. So we get the data from the get request for this transmission variable. And then we use the Django ORM to construct our first statement here where we're filtering the cars and only getting cars that are available. We then check to see if any transmission data was sent. In other words, when this request came in here, did we actually use this form on the left-hand side? And if we do have transmission data, we add another statement to this query set that we're constructing here. And it's a second filter where we check the transmission data for each of the cars returned on line eight. And we want to get back only the cars from that data that have a transmission that's equal to something that's in the transmission data we're extracting from the get request. Now, one thing I want to say here is that Django constructs these query sets lazily, so we don't pull out the cars on line eight. So when we perform that filter here, that builds up an SQL query behind the scenes. And then here, we're going to add another filter to that SQL query. In other words, we're gonna take the where clause from line eight, and we're gonna add another statement to that. So Django only pulls these data or pulls these objects out of the database when you actually refer to some of that data. 
and it's just because transmission can have multiple values so we're using the in modifier here when we do this filter statement to check the cars have a transmission that's equal to something that the user has submitted. Let's actually check this out now and see if it's working. So now that we're filtering down the cars here that we're passing to the paginator, if we go back to this page and refresh, this time you can look on the right hand side, all of these cars are manual except the one at the bottom, which is automatic. So if we select an automatic filter, you can see that it's now using HTMX and it's refreshing what we get back on the right hand side and replacing that with only automatic cars. And we only have one page of results for automatic cars. If we remove that, we get back the original set of cars and we can select manual here and scroll down and we can see that all of the cars are manual and we can also get a next page of results here. But we're gonna notice a problem when we do that. So I'm gonna click next here and we're gonna get the next page. But even though we have manual set on the left hand side, the next page contains some cars with a transmission type of automatic. So basically when we do the pagination, we're losing the data from the filter form. And again, there's a very simple solution to this. If we go back to filters.html, this statement here, where we include the values from the filter form, we can also do that in the pagination component. So let's go back here. And at the top, what I'm gonna do is just separate this into new lines. And we're gonna add that hx include attribute to this div here. So basically whenever we click any of the pagination links, it's also gonna include data from the filter form. And that's gonna make sure that we retain the data that's been selected by the user in that form. Let's test this out. And what I'm gonna do is go back to the page here. So if we refresh the page and again, select manual here, we have 10 cars available and we get the first page of results. When we go to page two though, you can see that all of the cars on page two are still with the transmission type of manual. So that's now working as well. What I want to tackle next is the clear all filters button in the left hand side in the filters component. And again, this is simple. We're just gonna trigger a request to the index page with no parameters. So let's go back to VS Code and do that just now. We're gonna to go to filters.html and I'm gonna remove the href on this anchor tag here and we're gonna add some attributes here. So let's start with hx get. We're gonna send a get request to the index URL and we're not gonna add any query string parameters to that. So that's gonna remove all the page stuff and it's gonna remove all of the data from the filter form. And again, our target here is gonna be the car list and that's gonna be inherited by this anchor tag as well as the swap mechanism. So just inheriting those, but we don't want to include the filter form. Now, because we don't want to include the filter form in this anchor tag, so we don't want that to be inherited, what I'm gonna do is just remove this here and I'm gonna add it to these below, these input elements directly. So when we need to include that form, which is on the input elements when they send a get request, we can do that explicitly here and remove it from the container, which is the div. And that means that this anchor tag will not inherit those. And because we're clearing all the filters, this makes sense. We don't want to include the form selected values because we're actually clearing those. So we're gonna remove that and prevent that being inherited. Let's now save this and go back to the page. And I'm gonna refresh this page. And when we select manual, we're gonna see that that changes from 15 to 10 cars. But this time when we click, or rather when we clear all filters, we get back 15 cars and we get back the total of three pages of data here. So that clear is now working. One issue we have is that the form is not clearing, but there's a simple fix to this. So again, let's go back to filters.html. What we're gonna do in the anchor tag here, when we click clear all filters, when we get back a response, we're gonna perform an action. So we can use hx on, which is another HTMX attribute. And then we're gonna use two colons because we're gonna reference an event that occurs within HTMX and that's the after request event. So after that request, we're gonna add some JavaScript code here to clear out the form. So the form has an ID of filter form. So let's copy the name of that ID and we're going to get a reference to that form with get element by ID. So let's call that function and pass the filter form in there. And in order to clear the form, we can call the form.reset method and that's gonna reset the form and clear all of the values. Let's test this out. If we go back to the page and refresh, this time when we select manual, we get back the list on the right hand side. But when we select clear all filters, you can see that it's removing the form on the left hand side. It's removing that selection and it's giving us back the original list of 15 cars. And that's gonna work for pagination as well. So when we go to the next page here, if we clear all filters, we get back the original page. Now, if you don't want to remove the pagination when you hit clear all filters, then there are ways to do that as well. You can maybe use the new query string template tag in Django. So if you have any ideas on that, feel free to leave them in the comments. Now I want to do one last thing in this video and that's show the filters section on mobile screens. 
So if we go to the smaller screen sizes here, you can see the filters on the left hand side are removed. That makes sense because we don't have the space to have filters on the left and the cards on the right. But of course, users might still want to filter the data on mobile. So let's see how we can maybe tackle this. Now if we go back to index.html and here we have the column system surrounding the filters on the left and the car list on the right. But on the smaller screens, the filters are hidden and that's using the hidden class from Tailwind which uses display none in CSS under the hood. Now ideally what we would do if we go back to the page is have some kind of icon at the top here that when we click is going to show the filters. Now I'm not going to bother grabbing an icon, I'm just going to define a button here. So what I'm going to do is copy the button that I've got prepared and right underneath the H1 tag, I'm going to paste this in. So it's a button with some classes from Tailwind and Daisy UI. The button class and then on large screens, we're going to hide that because on large screens, we're actually going to show the filter with display grid. So we don't need the button on large screens and we'll give it some margin bottom too as well. Now, importantly, I'm giving this button an ID of show filter button. And that's because we're going to write some JavaScript to handle this scenario. But let me just save this for now and go back to the page. And on the smaller screens, you can see the show filters button. It doesn't do anything at the moment, but when we go to the larger screens, you can see that it disappears as soon as we get back the filters on the left hand side. So the next step is that when this button is clicked, we want to actually show the filters that we have on the mobile view. And we want to do that above this form or rather above this car list that we have at the moment. Now we're going to write some simple JavaScript for this. So what I'm going to do within index.html is I'm going to write some JavaScript down here. Now in a real application, you wouldn't write this here, but I'm just going to do that in line just for simplicity. So let's create a script tag and I'm going to write this code fairly quickly. So what we're going to do is get a reference to the button and we gave the button this ID here. So we're going to use document.getElementById. And then we're going to take that button and we're going to add an event listener. And we're going to listen, obviously, for the click event. So when that button is clicked, we're going to perform some kind of action. And the callback function is going to take the event, which is the click event, and we're going to then work with that event here. Now, what I want to do is get the filter section here, and it's this one with an ID of filters, and that's a section element in HTML. And that is hidden on the smaller screens, but we're going to change that when this button is clicked. So let's copy the ID here and go back down to the event listener. And let's get a reference to the filter section. So let's create a variable called filter section. And again, document.getElementById, and the ID is going to be filters. Now basically what we're going to do here is create an if statement, and we're going to check if that filter section contains the hidden class. Now in HTML and in the JavaScript API, there is a class list element that contains all of the classes that are attached to an element. So we're going to check the filter section's class list, and that has a method called contains. So if it contains the hidden class, we're going to perform some kind of action here to show the element. So let's create the block of code for that. And then we can also create an else block. So basically the top section here, this if block is going to run if the filter section is hidden and the else block is going to run if it's not hidden. Now I'm going to copy this filter section reference because we're going to use that a lot here. So if the class list contains hidden, we want to show it. So what I'm going to do is remove that class from the element and we can call the remove method on the filter section dot class list in order to do that. So we're removing the hidden class and then what we want to do is add the grid class. So I'm going to copy this to the line below. And instead of display none, we're going to display it as a CSS grid. And we're also going to add some other classes here. So as well as grid, we want this to span a full four columns. And we're going to explain this in a second. So we're going to add the call span four class. And if we go to the top here, you can see that this section here is within a div that is already using CSS grid. And that parent div has the grid calls four. So on the mobile screens, what we want to do is we want to show the filters above the car list. And we want to give that the call span 4 class on mobile screens. So what we do here is add call span 4 and it's going to span the entire set of columns in that grid. And finally, I want to also add another class here and that's the margin bottom 4 class. So MB4 from Tailwind. And then what we can do is we can take e.target, which is the button that was clicked. And obviously what we want to do when we click show filters is we want to change the text from show to hide filters. So what we're going to do here when we remove the hidden class is we're also going to change the text content of that button. So let's do that just now. And the text is going to become hide filters. And what I'm going to do is just copy all of this and I'm going to paste it below here. And we're going to change remove to add. And then we're going to change all of these instances of add to remove. 
and also what we need to do when we click hide filters that's going to hide the filters and add the hidden class and we want to change the text content of the button back to show filters so this basically allows us to toggle whether or not the filters are going to be shown on the mobile screen using this button here so i'm going to refresh this and what we're going to do is click the button and you can see now that above the cards we can see the filter section and it's now taking up the full four columns of that layout on the mobile screen and we can click manual here and it's still going to perform the filtering and can also clear all filters here in order to clear those. Now as we make this bigger here it's going to remove that at the top and bring it back to the left hand side and then if we go back here we can also click hide filters and it's going to remove that from the DOM. So now on mobile screens we can toggle between having the filters showing and having them hidden and it's not going to interrupt the layout and it's not left to right on mobile instead it's going to be top to bottom using css grid so on smaller screens we can still see the filters if we want by clicking this button ideally this would be an icon but if you want to extend this example feel free to do so so that's going to be all for this video if you've enjoyed the video give it a thumbs up and if you want to support the channel we have a coffee page and i'm going to open that just now thanks very much to everyone that's donated to this page it's greatly appreciated and if you want to support the channel and keep this content free, check this out. It's in the description of the video. And if you want to add any more features to this application that we built, feel free to do so. The repository is in the description of the video. And I'd love to see how this could be extended in order to add new filters on the left hand side and new features to the page using HTMX. And if you enjoy this kind of content where we take a real website and clone the CSS and the styles and the functionality, also let me know if you'd like to see more of that. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.